Good evening, um, and a very warm welcome to LSE's Department of Economic History and this year's annual Epstein Lecture. This year, it's our great pleasure to welcome Professor James Feigenbaum um, as our Epstein Lecturer. Uh, my name is Patrick Wallace. I'm uh, one of the professors in the Department of Economic History and the uh, current head of the department. And one of the best things about that role is that every year I get to chair this event, which is a moment when we bring an outstanding uh, economic historian who's building a profile in the career to talk to us here at LSE. Uh, before we get to business, though, before we talk a little bit about that, um, just a few practicalities. Uh, this event is going to be recorded. It will be made available online afterwards. So hold that in mind when you ask your questions, perceptive as I'm sure they will be. Um, and after the lecture is finished, we will have time for some questions and discussion. Um, those of you who are joining us online, uh, please uh, put your question into the webinar format. Um, I'm assured that I will then be able to see it and I will be able to pose those questions to James when they come through um, after the talk is finished. Uh, please, if you do that, tell us your name as well. Um, so this is our annual lecture series, uh, which was established in the memory of Professor Larry Epstein, uh, a dearly missed colleague who was one of the most exciting economic historians of his generation. Um, Larry was a mentor to uh, a great number of uh, young economic historians. Uh, I benefited personally from his support, his guidance, um, and endless arguments where we kept on disagreeing about everything, really. Um, so for me, this is a moment where it's great to bring in other exciting young vigorous economic historians who themselves want to debate and engage with big ideas, because that is what Larry did. He engaged with big ideas, he brought new ways of thinking to them, and he stimulated us to think in different ways about topics which we may have thought we had answers to, and maybe we didn't. Um, recent lecturers have been really wide-ranging. We've had people like Marianne Wanamaker, uh, Mohamed Saleh, who's in the room, yay, uh, Marcella Arson, uh, Mark Koyama, uh, last year Mara Scriturini, and this year is the 16th lecture, so it's really been running now for quite a long time. Um, so this year's lecturer. This year's lecturer is James, James Feigenbaum. He's an assistant professor at Boston University uh, in his department of economics, and we're really pleased he was able to join us here in person today. Um, we invited James because of what he's done in really a very short amount of time. Um, I was trying to summarize this and I realized it was almost impossible to summarize his work easily um, or usefully really because there was so much and it was in so many different aspects of the broad space of American economic history. Um, he's written on health and disease, which is something close to my heart. He's written about inequality and social mobility, issues that are central to the discipline. He's written about technological change and its effect on labor markets, which is a massive question for the world today. And these are, and that is a characteristic of his work, these are not just questions of interest to economic historians. These are questions of interest to policymakers, to society, to people in the world today. And in addressing, in addressing each of these, James has taken up big questions, but he's also taken up big data, and he's used really novel and interesting methods in his engagement with it. Um, this is a moment when historical data has turned from a trickle to, at least in some areas, a fire hose. And managing that kind of enormous volume of material is, is something that's incredibly challenging and stimulating and it requires new tools, new techniques, new ways of thinking. Um, James has contributed to how we do this as well as what we think from it, and that's really amazing for someone at his stage. Um, and given that, it's only appropriate that his lecture today brings with it its own dizzying scale. 217 million census records. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> Uh, James, thank you very much, please. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, great. So, so first, I wanted to just thank Patrick for the his you know, incredibly generous introduction. Um, I'm really just so honored to be here to to speak with you all and to be here for the 2024 um, Epstein lecture. It really means like a, a really great deal to me to be able to speak at this event that that honors Larry Epstein. Um, one of the things you know I value so much as, as being an economic historian, I guess, is this ability to work across a bunch of different subfields and sort of genres. Is this this really great emphasis we have, um, an encouragement to learn from scholars in other fields, from like actual real historians uh, and other scholars, um, and to have these these conversations that cross disciplinary lines. Um, I think they're sort of all too rare in a lot of different areas of economics, but economic history, I think we've we've clung to this this ability to be interdisciplinary and, and across field. Um, and when I think of the Department of Economic History at LSC, I think that's one of the sort of the centers of this interdisciplinary drive. You know, have historians and economists and other people sort of all sitting together and talking together. I think is, is really wonderful. Um, and I know, you know, from from reading his work, from reading the tributes to his life, um, that that Larry was one of those rare scholars who was able to sort of reach across fields and also really valued that engagement, that that connection across fields and disciplines and subfields. Um, and, and I think that the culture sort of that endures at, at LSE Econ History is, is really a wonderful tribute to him. Um, and so I, I hope I've tried to bring some of these ideas into my work. I, I apologize to Patrick for, for spanning so many things and making it hard to, to summarize. I, I find sometimes it's hard for me to summarize what exactly it is I do. Um, and I also really hope that I'm always able to learn from, from historians. And I, I hope I won't offend anyone today with sort of what I haven't learned yet. Um, you know, I have, I have co-authors who are political scientists, who are sociologists, who are demographers, who are epidemiologists. Um, I'm even married to a, a real historian, um, although uh, given her views on quantification and on, on how I use commas, I don't anticipate us being co-authors ever. Um, and, and so tonight what I've tried to do is highlight some of the sort of interdisciplinary links in the talk. And, and I'm not going to pretend here that I'm not an economist. Um, there's going to be a lot about, about uh, identification and causality. Um, and if somebody wants to complain about standard errors during the Q&A, we can totally talk about that. Um, but my plan is also to really present something that's sort of work that's kind of more methodological, thinking about how to use all this new, big, exciting, historical micro data that we have to create even more new data. Um, and then also think about how the kinds of questions we can ask, the kinds of questions we can answer once we have that data. And hopefully be able to do this in ways that sort of span across, across disciplines. Um, another thing I'm going to try to do, so it's not just me talking about me, um, is I'm going to try to highlight some of the recent work from, from the, the next generation of economic historians. And, and mostly this will be sort of some of my current and former PhD students. Um, and I hope, again, that's sort of a fitting tribute to, to Larry's legacy as, as a great promoter of the next generation. So now this is, I guess, the next next generation. Um, you know, I know he cared so deeply about the people who were the, the future of the field. And so I'm hoping to, at least in some small way, pay that forward. Um, um, OK, so, so with an abrupt transition, of which there may be a few during this talk, uh, let, me, let me get into clicking on slides. Because um, first I have to click here, and then it will work. Um, except not quite. OK. So, as Patrick mentioned, we've sort of in economic history moved from this world of being kind of data poor to being data rich. Like all of a sudden we have all of this extra, we have all this, this data where we sort of didn't before. You know, in just the last few, few years, we've, we've gathered, you know, the complete count census records from the U.S., every single person, or at least uh, everyone who who's survives to make it into a census record from 1790 to 1940. We've got the 1950 census coming on the line really soon. In the U.K., which... Apologies, I'm just going to talk about the U.S. because it's sort of where my work is, but a lot of this hopefully travels across oceans. Um, similar big advents in, in like availability of new data, I guess, uh, 1851, not 41, I was told today, but up, up through 1921. Um, there's other efforts in other countries to sort of create and, and restore this, this micro data. Um, and maybe even more excitingly, we can take other other smaller samples and link that into the census and then create something else really new and exciting and follow people over time. And so all of this is really amazing. And what we should all really be motivated, at least at first, by is, is what are the kinds of questions that we can ask and answer? Um, and so the way I'm going to divide my talk uh, is, is before I get you to the good stuff, the what can we ask and answer, I'm going to make you, I'm going to drag you through sort of the methodologies of how do we build this data in the first place, how to create the link samples that we're going to use to ask and answer all these interesting questions. But I also know that economics audiences can be very impatient, especially when you can't ask questions during the talk. And so I'll give you some of the preview of some of the good stuff we can do, and then, and then we'll, we'll sort of go through the methods. 
So just a, a, a brief smattering of things. This is, this is a, a graph from one of my first papers um, in, that came out in EJ a few years ago on intergenerational mobility. So obviously the ability to find someone as a kid, link them to their future self, and understand what happened between when they were you know, in, their, in their parents' household to what they look like as an adult. That's something we can unlock with intergenerational links with, with linked census data. Um, this is probably a, a map, one of the most famous maps of the last decade in, in economics. It's certainly not economic history. It's, it's work from Raj Chetty and co-authors finding out about intergenerational mobility across the US in sort of the, the most recent generation. Um, I had a, a brilliant graduate student who thought to himself, can't we do this for history? Can I create intergenerational links and draw the same kind of map of mobility historically? I'll talk a bit about this. This is uh, Huiren Tan, who's, who's my former student at, at uh, NUS. Um, again, the kind of result is the kind of map that could only exist because we have access to the complete count data and the ability to link people over time. Um, a recent paper that I, I promise I will eventually talk about today, um, work with Dan Gross, where we, we try to understand how technology and how automation affects workers in the labor market. Um, and we want to be able to follow people over time to do this. And so, you know, census linking or, or methods of following people over time is all going to be required to do that. Um, a paper I probably won't talk as much about is, is joint work with Hui Ren about the return to education. Again, we want to be able to see people, in this case, find two siblings, two twins, find them as children, find them again as adults, and, and sort of make some claims about what was the return to education. I have a whole other research agenda um, that when I started to write these slides, I thought would be the sort of back half of the talk, and then I realized I was way beyond time on, on how many slides I had put in. So I'm not going to talk any more about this at all. But I have a whole other agenda sort of thinking about what we can learn about politicians from complete count census data. Um, so this is just a randomly chosen census record from 1940 that happens to have the Kennedy family. Um, and so there aren't that many pages in which we have, I guess, three four future senators and one future president. Um, and, and so we have this whole project of, of trying to find politicians in the census, understanding who, where they come from, understanding their backgrounds. Um, so some joint work with, with some political scientists where we do this for members of Congress. We learn a perhaps obvious fact that these guys are incredibly selected. Um, just a, a, a simple measure like, you know, is there someone in your family who finished college? Our future members of Congress, 30%, everybody else, 5%. And so we have, we have I promise there's more to that paper than just that. Um, I have another paper, again, with, with more political science co-authors. Um, we think about another thing that we can infer from the census, so your family background, your family history of, of immigration, or your parents or grandparents, were they immigrants? Um, and does that matter to how you vote in Congress? This is sort of over this, the long period from the, the late 19th century to the early 20th century, where there's a lot of really important immigration legislation in Congress. Um, does your background shape how you, how you vote? Uh, we, we show evidence in this paper that it does. This is just a simple correlation. We do some, some sort of causality. But again, that's, this is only just a, a, a sort of a, a taste of the, the possible work we can do once we can see people in the census, once we can follow them over time. Um, so like I said, we've gone from data poor to data rich. There's all these awesome questions. And I promise I'll get to some of what these questions are in a minute, or many minutes. Um, but before we get there, we've got to actually build the linked data sets to begin with. And here again, I mean, in some sense, you can think of this as like the plumbing. Um, but I think it's really important and really necessary and hopefully really useful plumbing um, in unlocking these, these, future, these future papers that I hope everyone's able to write. Um, and so where does this all start with? It all starts with the census. It all starts with you know, people going door to door in the 19th and 20th century asking people a bunch of questions about themselves. What's your name? Where were you born? How old are you? And then eventually sort of more interesting things in the US, eventually we get years of education, we get earnings, we get occupation. Um, so this is a cartoon from the Illustrated London News. Uh, someone's confused by the census form. This is a, a thing that I worry about constantly. Maybe all the data that I'm, I'm looking at is just you know, answers written by people very confused about what they're even answering. Um, but so be it. We'll, we'll try to deal with bad data as well. Um, here's another census taker from the same cartoon series. Um, Here's a, a photo, which will load, um, of, a, of an enumerator visiting a farmer in the 1940 federal census to sort of record his answers. So this is where that raw data is generated. Um, I think it's also really important to think about how this, this data comes into being um, and all the errors and, and issues it might contain as we think about census linking. So we'll kind of come back to this. Um, there's also these privacy rules we have to contend with. So in the US, it's only 72 years. Here, it's 100. Um, before we can see the names and see the sort of full complete count data and then be able to do a lot of the things we want to be able to do with it. 
Um, but I guess we're economic historians, and so a lot of you wait centuries upon centuries for your data. Um, and so, you know, what's what's a what's a hundred years between friends? Um, it also makes for this very exciting moment, right? Every in the U.S., every ten years, when we hit, you know, 2012, the 1940 data came out. 2022, the 1950 data, at least the pictures of it came out. Um, so we get to sort of have these moments or new projects that we could sort of dream about or think about for a decade are now finally able to be done. Um, there's a whole intellectual history and really fascinating story behind kind of sort of where we get from the raw census manuscripts to the data that I'm then going to work with. A lot of that's way beyond the scope of my talk. Uh, Steve Ruggles, for those who are interested, has a really fantastic sort of history of this, this period. I think this is actually an area which historians interested in the history of economic history um, could, could make a bunch of really interesting contributions. Um, I know all of this is sort of going on in the background, but like, let's just assume and pretend that we, the, the census numerators did their work, the transcribers and the digitizers did theirs, and now suddenly we have the, the complete count microdata. Um, and what a lot of microdata we have, right? Um, so I, I think I tried to get the title from like counting out the U.S. microdata uh, records, but obviously if you do this beyond the U.S., you get an even more ridiculously large number. So for about a decade, the North Atlantic Population Project did all this work to create all this microdata, um, about 100 million records. And in a decade since then, we've gone up a whole order of magnitude, right? We've got every U.S. census from 1790 to 1940, but for the, the sadly destroyed 1890 census. Um, we've got the British records. Um, there's a pair of Irish censuses and other countries as well. And so now we're at a billion, probably with 1950, will be over a billion of these micro data records. Um, and so I think the future is really bright for people who want to do economic history and want to ask questions that are sort of only answerable with this kind of data. More and more censuses from other countries, other regions, they're coming online. Um, and there's, there's two sort of real reasons, I think, to be excited about this. One is precision. That'll kind of be in the background of all of what I talk about when I, I tell you a bit about the telephone operator's paper. That's a paper that's sort of only possible because I can see every single telephone operator in the United States in the 20th century or the early 20th century. Um, and so precision is really important. But what I want to really focus on is the second piece, is this linking idea. This idea that like historical microdata in a cross section is interesting. We can learn a lot of things. But being able to follow people over time, being able to follow families over generations, that really unlocks a whole suite of research ideas um, and, and enables us to do all of this stuff. Um, that said, the data doesn't, isn't, isn't going to cooperate. And so we're going to have to fight with a little bit to sort of get it into the position we want to be able to do something. This is sort of a well-known challenge to anyone who's like fired up Ancestry.com or any of these other genealogical websites and tried to do their own family history, or really anyone who's had like two different lists of names written by two different people and tried to connect them across space. Um, names are really messy. The historical records we have, we don't have unique identifiers. We don't have a social security number, uh, or I guess whatever the social security number equivalent is in the UK. Instead, we're going to have to rely on fields, sometimes recorded with some noise or with some mess, but that we hope that aren't likely to change over time are going to allow, allow us to make a link of this person is the same person in this year as they are in the, the next year. Um, so here's, a, uh, again, another purely randomly chosen uh, census record that just happens to have a, a Nobel Prize winner on it. Um, and, uh, so my, my PhD advisor uh, is, is here as a, as a three-year-old in, in her uh, parents' household. Um, and and uh, I, I put this up here mostly because I, I know that I wouldn't be a, a one one percent of the economist I am without, without her training. Um, and so we can't really link her backwards because this is 1950 and, and she's only three. So she's not going to be in 1940. But her, her father and her mother might. Um, and so we see there they are, Leon Golden, you know, 31, born in New York. And so we know he's there in 1950. Do we find a 21-year-old Leon Golden in, in 1940? And in fact, we do. We can see him. Um, you know, he's, he's born in New York. The age is right. He's 21. It's probably the right person. And we could, we could verify. We could ask Claudia. Um, uh, I think that her, her grandmother's name is Dale, which is also her middle name. So that's probably good com confirmatory evidence that we've made the right link. But I, I guess I'm here to tell you that it's almost never this simple and this obvious, right? There could be 20 more Leon Goldens from New York of about the same age. There could just be one more, and then it would still be hard to know who was the right person. There could be someone who's 20 or 22 or 25 or, or sort of a little bit off on age. You know, there, he could have been as a Leo or a, a Golden with an E or Golden with an ING. There's all these kinds of problems. Um, and, and for one individual family member, you can just sort of work your way through the genealogy and figure this out. 
but I don't want to run a regression with one person or 10 people or 100 people. I want to run it with thousands of people, millions of people. And so we've got to figure out a way to kind of do this, this at scale. Um, so names are really messy. Um, here's an example from a recent paper from Gosh et al. Um, this is just basically handwriting is, is variable. Um, these are two different enumeration districts in the same street in Los Angeles, South Highland Ave. And we can see the, the person who did this enumeration is a wonderful person and writes in block print and everything's really easy to read and the linking rates are fantastic because there's very few typos or transcription errors. And the person down here is a monster. Um, and they've written in some horrible looping font and, and like it's, it's just a mess. And it's much, much, much more difficult to make these links. And it's obviously no fault of the people on this, this list, but it's just going to be much harder to make those links because those names are going to come into us as, as the researcher with a bunch of error. Um, this is the, the Feigen mom version of this. So this is, this is I think, a family I'm, I'm not related to. At least I, I couldn't figure it out because the records were so bad. Um, in 1940, where the father, Nathan Feigenbaum, is recorded as, as Mother Teigenbaum. Um, <laughs> You can kind of see where this error comes from, right? The T and the F in cursive are kind of the same. They're just missing the little bar. Um, the Nathan as mother is probably weird, but who knows? Um, you know, son Mo as May, and, and there's a bunch of other issues. This whole family is like completely wrongly enumerated in 1930. And so again, if this was your uncle or your grandfather or something, like you could you could triangulate this. But at the scale we want to work on these records, we kind of need it. We need a solution that's going to you know be able to work with this sort of messy data that comes in. Um, there's also problems with age. Uh, you know, uh, I hate to say, but like if you called up your, your children or your mother today and asked them how old you were, they might not remember exactly. And this is exactly like this happens on the census, right? People are answering these questions for their family members. There's imprecision. The, the exact question is actually what, how old are you, not what year were you born. And so if you take the census in June versus April versus January, you're born in February, that might change by more than 10 years between census. So there's all these kinds of problems. Um, and even in beautifully genealogically linked data, we see a bunch of people who don't seem to grow by 10 years every year. Um, so we've got, again, we've got to sort of account for this. If we build our analysis with this biased data, um, our, our results could be wrong. Our, our, our output could be wrong. This is just a really simple picture that sort of freaked me out the first time I drew it. Um, I had this, this project where I linked these sons of Iowa from 1915 to 1940. Um, I guess I apologize in advance. I didn't realize how much I'd talk about Iowa tonight. Um, to an audience that probably has been to Iowa as many times as I have. Um, but you know, if you just look at the sons who stay in Iowa, their distribution of earnings looks very different than the, the ones who leave and go to the whole country. And so if our data is in some way like only picking up the non-movers or somehow biased in its construction, it's going to lead us in all sorts of different paths. And so, okay, linking is, is sort of inevitably imperfect. There's a lot of things in, in the census data that ca can go wrong and sometimes do. So what are we going to do about this? Um, the way I think about this is we sort of face a trade-off. And you can think about this as like a type 1 error versus a type 2 error. In sort of a more machine learning way, we can think about false positives and false negatives. But basically, whenever we're looking at a record, there's some risk that we're going to make the wrong match in the sense that we're going to say these two people are the same person, but they are not. And there's also some chance of the opposite. We're going to make, we're going to decide not to make a match, and those two people were in fact the same person. And we've, we've sort of missed them on that end. And obviously, there's a trade-off. If we're really aggressive about making matches, we're going to have a lot of false positives, not so many false negatives. If we're really conservative about making matches, we're going to have not so many false positives. Maybe we'll have a bunch of, of false negatives. Um, and so in my view, and I think this is sort of just like a general, generic kind of principle, it would be great if our record linking algorithms or our, our methods were efficient, right? Of the matches out there to make, we make a lot of them. They're accurate of the matches we do make. Hopefully, they're good ones. And it would be great if it were unbiased, or at least that you know, the linking that we made wasn't creating like a horribly weird sample. And we know in some ways, inevitably, bias is going to creep back in. We're going to hopefully deal with it da downstream. Um, but it's, it's sort of there. But I also started this work when I was a graduate student. Um, and so I thought to myself, these are all good, good you know, principles to have, but they're not the whole sum of research. Um, because if there's, there's one thing you learn as a, as a graduate student, it's the, uh, the fact that you're broke and the fact that you're running out of time. Um, and so as you think about doing this, doing it by hand seems like a great idea, except it's really, really slow and really, really expensive. Um, and so if we're going to design a way to do this sort of record link and we're going to create these links, wouldn't it be great if we also got one that was kind of fast, um, or at least not horribly slow, and, and not expensive? It also might be nice if it's sort of consistent and replicable. Again, like 
you know, this is the problem of why did you make this link? It'd be a lot better to be able to point to, oh, because the algorithm had these parameters and then we got this out of it, as opposed to, oh, this really smart RA that I had uh, was working as a research assistant for me. They're now, this is 10 years ago, I don't have their email address anymore, and they decided that this was the right decision to make. Um, that's super replicable. It might not even be consistent. Like sometimes they do the linking when they're tired and sometimes they do it when they're awake and you get different results. Um, and obviously it would be also nice if, if this were flexible. So, you know, what I'm going to tell you about is a system that's hopefully going to be a good, do a good job of linking people within the U.S. census, census to census. But wouldn't it be great if we had a record linking procedure that also worked for the U.K. censuses or for linking someone from Norway to the U.S. or someone from the U.K. to the U.S. or someone from, you know, some list of a thousand people you got from over here into the census, like something that's sort of flexible enough that the same idea could sort of be applied in different domains. Um, and so, okay, the answer to all of that, except maybe the cost, might be just doing it by hand, right? It's probably pretty accurate. If you have enough time, it's probably pretty efficient. It's probably unbiased. But of course, it's really, really slow and it's really expensive. And I think this is sort of, you know, maybe not totally obvious, but it's gonna depend on these sort of potentially imperfect choices made by one researcher at one moment. And maybe we wanna kind of smooth some of that out. Um, and so, that's sort of where I, where I come to is sort of the, the machine learning approach. And now I want to say this is not really the only state-of-the-art algorithm. There's, there's been a lot of sort of movement in this literature in the last 10 years. Um, so uh, Abramitsky, Bustan, and Erickson, and sort of Joe Ferry before them sort of have had this idea that like, well, we could just write down sort of a list of rules. And then if you pass these, these rules, then you get to make the link. Um, there's all sorts of variations on that you can do. You can download all their data from the Census Linking Project, and that's great in terms of linking census to census. There's another sort of idea that, that Ron and some of his grad students worked on as well. So I, I view sort of machine learning as, as an, an alternative or as another option within this set. Um, and the basic idea of what I'm going to try to explain in, in how this algorithm works, it's actually quite easy. It's that we think the humans are pretty good at this. The problem is it's just too slow and there's just too much data. And so we're going to sort of try to exploit that humans are good at this, but also exploit that computers are really good at learning even in, in sort of very uh, not obvious ways to us, how people did things. And so we're going to train an algorithm essentially with those links that were done by hand. We're going to train the algorithm to work like a human RA, um, to make the same kind of trade-offs a human RA might make between what letters look like what other letters, what ages, errors are acceptable versus not acceptable, and sort of go from there. Um, I also want to say, I guess this wouldn't be true if I'd written this slide uh, five years ago, I'm not the only one doing machine learning. Might have been the first, but that's okay. Um, uh, some of these, these, these algorithms like bl even blow my mind. So, so Joyce Helgertz and co-authors at, at Minnesota have this project in historical methods where they, they do sort of a, a machine learning version. Uh, Casey Buckles and Joe Price have another data set where they trained on you know, 10x, through, uh, 100x the number of links that I've trained on, again, are going to do the same sort of idea. They're going to say, humans look pretty good at making these links, but can we teach a computer to make these links like the human did? Um, and so, okay. So what does the machine learning method actually, actually do? Well, the basic idea is that we want to just replicate how a well-trained, and this is key, hyper-consistent research assistant might make these links, right? Someone, the very best research assistant you've ever had, but you never have to pay them um, at least after they make the first links, um, and they never get tired or distracted. They just like they, they just generate the links all the time. Um, the idea, the key idea, is to take all these implicit rules, all these judgments you had to make, um, and let the machine make those rules explicit. Um, okay, so just the, I'm going to give you sort of the, the general sense of this, and then I'm I'm going to try to transition into sort of what we can do now we have these link samples. Um, so consider we're just a very simple record linking procedure, right? We have young sons in 1910, and we're going to try to link them into the 1940 census. You basically start with a, a really simple step of like, I have all these guys in, in, in the first data set. Let me find anyone who could be you in the next data set. For sort of computational reasons, you've got to put some parameters on that. Like maybe you don't let people change their birthplace. Maybe you, you block on... Uh, you block on first name or last or first letters or last letters, although I'm a little wary of that given like the, the Feigenbaum Teigenbaum example. Um, maybe you block on some age range, like whatever those are sort of parameters in your control, but you create the possible set of people who could be this person. 
you grab a bunch of those links and you hand them to your, your, yourself or your brilliant research assistants or some combination of the two. And you, you write down, okay, actually this, this person matches this person, this person doesn't, this person matches this one, this one I'm not sure about, so I'm not gonna make a match. You sort of go through this, you build your training data set. Um, I have some other work trying to answer the question of how small or how big this training data set needs to be. It's not totally obvious. This isn't really a case where like in most machine learning applications, more data is always better. I think we hit diminishing returns relatively quickly in the linking context, um, but I don't have, a, I don't have a, a magic end star to give you of, of where you can stop uh, doing that. Um, and then, but once you have that data, then we're gonna train the algorithm. And it's gonna, again, try to approximate what the manual linker is gonna do based on all these different record linkage features. Um, and this is gonna vary context to context, right? You know, we can measure string distances. How similar are these names in terms of the characters? Maybe we'll, we'll do some sort of sound score. Do the words sound alike? Maybe we'll be really uh, interested in character matching, like if the, this first character matches or the second matches. Um, maybe we know there are certain letters that get mistranscribed for others, either for sound reasons or for sort of cursive curly Q reasons. And we, we sort of build in these features that a human might sort of implicitly know about um, and that we can sort of encode into the, the linking procedure. What I think is really, I hope, valuable about the machine learning approach is that this is sort of you're in your control. If you're smarter than I am, which I'm sure you are, like you can come up with more features to bring in. Or if your context is, you know, people moving across an ocean and, 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 and sort of Americanizing their name, like you can bring extra data that tells you about that into the context to sort of be able to make these links. Um, you know, maybe you're working with data where you observe year of birth and not age, and so you're more or less aggressive on, on including these sort of year of birth features. And then, the really simple step, the only, the only uh, this is the only slide that's gonna have Greek letters on it. Um, you know, for all those people you started with, just apply the algorithm, and you're done. And you suddenly you have a link sample of like, this person links this person, and this person doesn't link this other person. Um, and so what I do is, is sort of a, a relatively simple thing. Um, Basically, I just run a probe it. You know, you've got all this data linked by, by hand, uh, all those humans making really careful human intuition. Um, and then we, we sort of suck all that up into this algorithm and we get a bunch of, of predictions of, of who should match who. Um, and then, and then again, this is where the flexibility comes in. Um, you've got all these scores, you know, does this person match with this person on some, some metric? And then you as the, as the researcher can say, I'm only gonna make links that are sort of sufficiently good or sufficiently better than the next best match. And again, if you're in a context where you're really, really worried about false positives, well, you can, you can pick the parameter here to be really big and like really, you know, smash down the, the close calls. You're only gonna pick the obvious cases. Or maybe you're in a case where the sample was small to begin with, you're okay with some false positives, you're really worried about false negatives, you can pick sort of different parameters. Or maybe you get me as a referee, and I tell you like you just need to do it seven different ways, um, and show me that your end downstream result just isn't a function of, of these sort of research or degrees of freedom you had. Um, and so again, that's where the sort of the, the, the uh, freedom is. Um, and so this used to say an angry reason referee, but it's been enough years that I'm, I'm a little uh, less salty. Um, <laughs> so basically said, you know, this isn't machine learning, you're just using a probe. And it's, it's not, entirely wrong, but like at its core, it really is machine learning in its basic sense, right? The machine, the computer, is learning from something the human did. How complicated and or simple the model is, is sort of besides the point. It's, it's, it's still the same principle. Um, and you're also, this is again something you face as, as you try to explain these methods, um, you know, you have to think about who your audience is. And so I wrote this originally as a graduate student, this, this sort of idea, and then you're sort of torn between two worlds. So I do something really, really fancy so people think I'm really smart, um, or do I do something that people can also use so that other people like get use out of it? And I think in some way, I guess why I ended up with a probit, um, is I was more in that latter camp. It's like I want this to be a tool that people are able to use to, to do census linking. Like I kind of didn't want to be the only person to be able able to pull off census linking or, or among a few small set of people. Um, and so hopefully, you know, this, that's, that's sort of where I, where I came down. Hopefully it was the right choice. Um, and I think you can see this more broadly in the sort of the linking literature. Like, again, this is a difference now from, from 10 years ago, is there's a bunch of off the shelf links that you can like, if you're interested in linking census to census, you can go download and use because a bunch of other people in this literature felt similarly that like, we don't want linking to be sort of a, a, gate, a gate to not let people do the research that they want to ultimately do. Um, and so again, the whole goal here is to take those implicit rules, the judgments that a human made, and like let the machine learn how to do this, how to write down those rules as explicitly as possible. Um, 
Okay, so how does the method actually do? Basically, it does really well. Um, there's a bunch of numbers here. It's like essentially, uh, when I first ran this, I was like, oh, I guess I can fire my RAs. Um, or at least the, you know, I don't need to keep, to keep having them do linking. Because like the, the computer does like a really good job of, of getting the links that the human would make and the links that it does make are, are pretty accurate. Obviously, this is going to vary context to context. Um, it's going to vary RA to RA, maybe. It's going to vary census to census. Um, we do a bunch more work in this recent ish JEL paper with, with Ron and, and Catherine and Leah and Santi, um, where we you know compare to the Union Army sample that Dora Costa and her team linked at the cost of many, 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 many hours. Um, and what we basically find is that the sort of the methods kind of generate a little bit of a frontier. And the ML methods in particular sort of all sit reasonably close to where the hand linkers are in this context. That like that basically the machine can do enough work, can learn enough from the humans to sort of become human-ish, at least in its, in its, its census linking abilities. Um, and so ultimately, I, this is now the, the, the method is sort of out there, you know, we're going to want to do some kind of economics. We're going to do economic history, or maybe even you're, a, you're here from some other social science field, and you want to do something with it, right? Uh, very few people get up in the morning and are, are sort of desperate to learn how to link data. They link the data for a reason. And so it would be really nice to know whether how I link the data, at least if I do it sensibly, is that going to matter downstream? Um, and this is still a bit of an open question. At least in the sort of analyses that we've done with this, the answer usually tends to be no. As long as you don't do something totally crazy, um, you get a figure like this in the end of most of my papers and most of other people's papers, where like whichever method we do, the red line is sort of the, the, you know, the hand-linked uh, estimate of this, you know, simple intra-generational elasticity. Um, and basically, you can see all the methods are, are kind of straddling this line. Um, and that would be the goal, I guess, right? That, like, our, our science isn't totally influenced by our linking, as long as we sort of do it reasonably well. Um, and then, again, I guess I'm outing myself as a referee, so if I, when I see a paper that does linking and doesn't show me at least some nod towards robustness across methods, I promise I'm not just trying to get people to cite me, um, you know, this, is, this seems really valuable because like, if, if you find a result that only exists because of some you know, special souped up way that you did your linking and it doesn't work any other way, it makes me a little bit skeptical of, of what's going on under the hood. Um, okay. So this has been this moment of like all these other fantastic tools within the linking space, like the census linking project, the census tree. There's other sort of really amazing tools that are out there. Um, perhaps these are all US based and so maybe there's other stuff coming uh, in the UK based space. So the, the census place project has done an amazing job of like basically putting people from the census onto a map, getting really like, really like town level precise latitude and longitudes on them. Um, there's been, just like last week, Andy Ferrara and some co-authors put out these, these basically a, a method for sort of crosswalking geographies as they change over time um, in a much more sophisticated way than like some papers that I wrote 10 years ago tried to do. Um, well, my screen has disappeared, but that's okay. Um, and then something I've, I've just been working on like the last couple of weeks um, is this sort of vector space of names um, where you can kind of think about every time we make a census link as, as an observation of, of how a name might change, right? Someone who was, you know, Tom in one census might be Thomas in another, or, or Tomas might become Thomas. Um, and there's also typos, and you might imagine how those change over time. Um, and we can use, like, maybe really good genealogical links, like the, that Joe Price is kind enough to share with all of us, to sort of learn about that transition matrix. Um, you can throw that into a fancy vector space, which is another way to just tell people you know how to do a lot of math. Um, and now this is just at two dimensions. The reality of this is like more like 150 dimensions, so I've boiled it down to make it presentable. But you get actually decent, decent results that like the names that are sort of the same name all kind of a little bit sit together, close together. And so you can learn, you know, these are all obvious. I don't think I'm blowing anybody's mind by saying that some of these names can be turned into some of these other names. But you can learn things that you might not have otherwise known about, you know, how names sort of transform over time. Again, unlocked because we have, because we have this data. Um, okay, so we can link census records. Hooray. And now I've explained to you all how to, how to do it, at least at a, at a sort of high level, how to do, how to think about machine learning and, and census linking. Okay, so what can we actually do with it? Like, if I did all that and then we just asked a bunch of boring questions, I think no one would care, um, right? We're all, no one, again, we, well, we all get up in the morning because we want to try to answer questions about the world, answer questions about history, um, and hopefully this has been a method that's going to allow us to do things like that. Um, 
So again, I, I, I previewed this before, you know, the return to education in 1940. Um, you know, this is an old question about like, is, is human capital valuable? As many of us who are providers of human capital, it would be, I guess, in our interest for this to be true, that like every additional year of schooling you get makes you a lot richer and our students should pay us lots of money to, to give them those additional years. Um, but it's, it's sort of a, it's an, by its nature, a causal question. And so in the middle of the 20th century, we have a bunch of correlational evidence that suggests actually the return to schooling was quite low. Um, but there weren't a bunch of causal estimates out there. So Clearan and I did a very simple thing. We sort of borrowed from the more contemporary literature that uses twins to kind of difference out nature and nurture and just exploits the differences in education between a pair of twins and asks, well, do they have different levels of earnings? And it turns out that you know, the, the correlations were roughly right, that, that this is a relatively low but positive and significant sort of return to education in the middle of the 20th century. Um, Again, the, the map of, of mobility that I showed you before from Huren. So this is, this is what mobility looks like today. We can see that you, know, you kind of want to be a poor kid growing up in the Midwest or the Northeast or definitely on the West Coast. You're more likely to move up. Um, the picture is very different in the early 20th century. Again, data you could only do with census linking. Um, but you know, some places, New York is always good. Um, but the West Coast is very different. The sort of balance of power within the Midwest has flipped very dramatically. Um, this is another former student of mine, Hannah Schwenk, who's now at, at Bonn. Um, so her job market paper was all about the effects of migration. She exploited the, the fire in San Francisco in 1906. She knows precisely where which neighborhoods were burned down. Um, and she's going to just you know, very, very cleanly sort of exploit the differences between you know, someone who grew up here and someone who grew up here, someone who was displaced by the fire versus their neighbor who wasn't. And what she's going to show you is, is that, yes, these guys are more likely to move. Um, and then in, in that movement has some costs. The people who end up moving sort of end up in lower sort of status occupations. Obviously, her John Murray paper does a lot more than two slides, but uh, that's what we have time for. Um, Sophie Lee, who's another one of my students who was in the market this year, um, has, a, has a question about uh, women-friendly occupations, sort of this, this debate of this vicious cycle, right? Do, do women not have jobs in the early 20th century because they have no experience, or do they have no experience because they couldn't get jobs in the first place? And so she exploits this sort of interesting historical fact that lots and lots of women, married women in particular, were appointed as postmasters in the US. They ran local post offices. Way beyond, like the first time she told me the number of, of women postmasters, I assumed she'd had a data error or something, um, the linking error problem. But no, there really are all these women who run post offices. Um, and what she finds is because sort of the political nature of this job, um, there's a really sharp change in the odds that you sort of get to continue being a postmaster whether you were appointed by, by Hoover or by FDR, you know, right around the 1930 election, no, 32 election. Um, because, you know, basically FDR reappointed his postmasters, Miss post, Postmaster Women too, um, and didn't appoint, reappoint the Hoover appointees. And so, so if he finds this big effect on sort of years of experience, basically if you're, if you're the Democrat appointed here, you get like another four or more years of labor market experience. And it, it sort of matters in 1940 because they're still likely to be postmasters. But in the long run, having this extra experience as a postmaster doesn't matter at all. That sort of even giving someone exogenously more experience doesn't really do anything for their sort of labor market attachment. Um, she finds it a couple different ways. Um, OK, so those are sort of the quick hits on, on the sort of the next generation. And I guess now I get to talk about my favorite topic, which is the papers that I write. Um, and so I'm going to try, being aware of my, my timing, as always, is, is excellent, um, that in the next you know, 15 or so minutes, I'll, I'll cover these two papers. Um, and so the first one I want to talk about is, is joint work with, with Dan Gross. Um, and it's about telephone operators. Um, and I promise, telephone operators are, are much more interesting than you might imagine they are uh, right now. We'll, we'll get there in a few minutes. Um, and so in, in essence, this is a paper sort of motivated by a couple pictures. Here's a, a picture of telephone operators in 1913. Um, and here's a picture of them in, in 1919. What we can see from these photos is it's, it's, they're almost exclusively women, exclusively young women, um, white young women. You can't see from this picture, but they're also almost exclusively US born white young women. Um, and this is what sort of the, the operator system looks like a few years later. Um, all the people, all the women have been replaced by machines. Um, these are, you know, automatic dialing machines. You pick up the phone, you dial numbers, as, as I guess we do, um, and, and the machine connects the calls. Whereas in the past, it, you would get this operator, and she would literally physically connect, you know, these cables from one line to the other. Um, and so this is a, a massive amount of sort of technological change. And what we want to know 
we might be worried about this for the future, and then it's, it's nice to go back to the past to study it. You know, what happens when a technology shows up and just whole scale replaces a major occupation? Um, I say major because something like 2%, uh, I'm now jumping around in slides, that's okay. Um, uh, this major occupation that, that you know, employed like 2% of, of young women sort of just disappears. Um, and okay, so we're, so we're sort of interested in this question. Um, so the telephone industry is really interesting. It's sort of just made up of AT&T. They used to employ this big army of young women, and today, obviously, these operators don't really exist anymore. Um, so dial rolls out in a really interesting pattern for us, um, city by city. So the technology exists, but because of sort of managerial complex complexities, it takes AT&T a while to sort of treat different places. As an econometrician, this is fantastic, right? You get some treatment cities, some control cities in the same year. You can difference things out. It's like sort of empirically very, a very nice setting to be working in. Um, and it's also just, it's a really massive shock. There's just a huge number of people who lose their jobs because of this. And the, the automation, the technology is gonna replace most of the functions of these local operators. It's a really big deal at the time. Um, there's a bunch of interesting questions sort of embedded in this story. Um, we've got some papers about the rest of them, but what I'm going to focus on right now is, is number four. So what were the effects on these workers and on labor markets, and particularly with the effect of an incumbent telephone operator? This is your job, um, and then suddenly the machine comes and takes it. What happens to you? Um, so there's a, there's a long technological history. This is the part, you know, the paper we've learned a lot from sort of historians of technology, um, and, and we want to figure out how to, how to do this. Well, first, we, the first challenge is to just measure this. We go digging in the AT&T archives. Um, this may not come as a shock to anyone who's looked in corporate archives. They're a little bit incomplete. And so we have some sense from AT&T as to how they do, did this, but we don't have like the perfect smoking gun data set of every year in every city when they made these changes. What we actually rely on much more than the, the archival data are these newspapers. Um, we can see for like, you know, a given city, a given system, exactly when these changes are going to be because it's reported about it and, and you know, big fun headlines um, in the local newspapers. And so we go out and we collect all this data to figure out exactly for which city on which day or which month or which year, you know, this, this cutover to dial is going to happen. Um, the, the example I guess I give, we give in the paper that will mean frankly nothing to anyone here, um, is there's three sort of former mill cities outside Boston. There's Worcester, Lowell, and Lawrence. And like, to a first order approximation in 1920, these cities are all extremely similar in their demographics, in their economy, like they, their history, they're all very, very similar. And for sort of weird internal AT&T reasons, they all get cut over at very different times. That's the sort of the ideal comparison I want you to have in your mind as I show you the, the effects of this. Um, and so, turns out, the job goes away. Um, let me show you this picture, it's even, even starker. This is basically measuring every two years what share of uh, of, of women who are US born, who are white and who are young are working as telephone operators. And at, right immediately after the technology shock, this thing goes down by about two percentage points. That's basically the amount of, of the share of the women who are telephone operators. This, this occupation essentially gets eliminated overnight in these cities that have this technological change. Um, and so our question again is, well, what happens when this occupation disappears? What happens to the people who used to have this job? Um, and so, uh, if I didn't make you excited about census linking before, hopefully I get to do it again now. Um, to understand these effects, we're going to have to track these women over time, right? We're going to have to see the woman who was a telephone operator in 1930 in, in Worcester, and what is she up to in 1940, 10 years later? Um, this is hard. Uh, so linking men across census waves is like tricky, but we can do it. You know, we've got census linking, we've all been doing this for a while. It's not like trivial, but it's, it's doable. Um, linking women gets harder. Um, and linking young women is basically close to impossible, right? This, this young women in the U.S. have this horrible habit of changing their last name when they get married. And no matter how much data I throw at you, it's going to be really hard for any fancy, fancy, fancy machine learning algorithm to predict how someone's name might change when they get married. Because you're going to predict who they're going to marry. That's ridiculous. Um, and so... Actually, this is a paper where it turned out, I guess this is to the, to the flexibility point, where like the linking algorithm that I, I lovingly told you about you know, 10 minutes ago is just not gonna work at all, because we're just, we're not in the right setting. Um, and so, okay, what can be done? Can we collect marriage records? Maybe in some places, but it's really sort of scattered and inconsistent, and that's really not gonna work for, for all the 50 states, because again, we want to exploit this rich geographic variation. 
Um, there's historical social security registration records that people are using more and more in the US. Um, but even for our, our purposes, like the sort of the timing wasn't quite right. They were, they were really messy when we tried. Uh, we attempted because we, we, we were hopeful, but then we eventually abandoned it. Um, and so what we end up doing is essentially letting someone else do our work for us. Um, not unlike the, the machine learning that lets the RA learn how to do this. In this case, we're going to uh, let genealogists, um, in particular people who are users of FamilySearch.org, this sort of online genealogy tool, this wiki-like genealogy, who have created their own family trees and done these links, um, we're just going to take those off, off the shelf. Um, we're going to sort of rely on descendants and other genealogists to tell us which census record reflects the same person over time. Um, and so specifically what we do is we find all these women who have been telephone operators in 1920 or in 1930. We go searching for them on the tree, and the tree says, aha, this is this person, or it says, I have no idea who that person is, and, and it's a, a false, it's a, it's a no match. Um, and then the tree tells us, aha, they're also linked to this other year in the census. And now you have this woman as a telephone operator in 1920, and we know what else she was up to in 1930. Um, and sort of a, a key piece of this paper is we do this for these other demographically similar women, the sort of control group. Why I think this is really key is who's on the tree is like far, far, far from random. Um, I'll, I'll show you like one or two pictures of this. Uh, Family Search is a, is a product of, of, the, of the LDS church. And so if you're born in Utah, you're way more likely to be on the tree. Um, if, you're, if your name is, is more common, there's a little bit of a sort of a, a, a gradient to this, right? If you have an incredibly uncommon name, you're more likely to get linked. If you have an incredibly common name, a little bit less likely to be on the tree. Similar with last names. Family size is sort of really dramatic. If like the first time we see you as an operator, you're living by yourself. We don't know how many sort of relatives are in your house or there's no other relatives in your house. You're not so likely to be on the tree. The bigger your family gets, the more likely you're, be, you're to be on the tree. This kind of makes sense. The bigger your family is, more descendants, more likely someone at some point has, has done your genealogy. And so these are all challenges, right? Um, you know, I could find a really big effect on family outcomes and maybe it's just the sort of selection that got you into my data set. And that's so why that's why that control group is really, really important. The, the sort of women who look a lot like you, right? They're in your same census enumeration district, your neighborhood. They're similar in age, race, nativity, parental nativity. We match in a bunch of different characteristics. This gives us a bunch of people who should be subject to all those same selection problems to get onto the tree, and, but who hopefully are, are sort of unaffected by the telephone operator shock, right? You versus your neighbor, you had the misfortune of being in the wrong occupation that happened to get walloped by this technology shock. And your neighbor didn't. And so whatever difference we see between you two 10 years later, it's not going to be because of any weirdness from the tree. It's going to be the effect of the telephone operation uh, technology shock. Um, and so we're going to run a regression, a very simple one of you know, CV operators on the tree who haven't been cut over yet compare them to their controls in the you know, 10 years after the, the shock happens. Um, our outcomes are gonna be a bunch of different things, but I'll, I'll just show you the, the, the tables. Um, if I could make these pictures, I would have, so apologies, we'll have to read some regression tables. The basic first story is that like, these women are way less likely to be telephone operators anymore in the telephone industry, which is to say, they're way less likely to be still working for AT&T. This is true across all ages, and then we're going to split the sample for some other things into sort of younger ages. And I'll be very cognizant of the fact that I'm going to describe 26 plus as older women, um, uh, which sometimes gets, uh, gets, gets me into trouble. Um, and so what we see is there after the, if you're an operator and it's after a cutover, you're just much less likely to still be a, an AT&T employee in the, in, as an operator. There's some story in the historical record that AT&T did a good job of sort of shifting these women into other occupations within AT&T. The data, there's some stars, there's some positive numbers, but like by and large, these magnitudes are minuscule compared to the size of this displacement shock. This isn't all that surprising. The new jobs that AT&T created after this shock were things like um, engineer. Uh, so in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, there's not a ton of, of women working as engineers anywhere and not in the telephone industry. And then the other category of jobs are things like pollmen and linemen, where like, the guys who climb up telephone poles. And you can see how the, the name of the occupation suggests it's not going to be a very gender uh, equal occupation. Um, they also don't transition to being an operator in other industries. There's, there's still telephone operators, like working at you know, universities and hospitals and hotels. But this is a much smaller field than the sort of AT&T workforce had been. And so there are some of these jobs, but just not that many. 
Um, instead, what we mostly see is sort of a disemployment effect. This is especially large among the sort of the older operators, the people who we think basically had a lot more experience as an AT&T operator, the people who sort of invested more specific human capital in telephone operation, that losing this job is, is sort of a, a big setback to them. For some of the younger women who might have you know, naturally transitioned out of the workforce into, into marriage and, and fertility, or who might have just been an operator for a few years and were going to bounce around into other jobs anyways, we don't see as sort of stark of an effect on, on their employment rates. Um, click. We also see a big decrease in sort of the, if they hold a job, sort of the, the quality of the job. And this is, you know, admittedly, we're sort of, uh, the census is wonderful, but there are also ways in which the census is less than wonderful. Um, we don't start recording earnings data in the U.S. Census until 1940. And so the best we can do is basically find out what occupation you do and sort of what's the average or the median earnings within that occupation and sort of call that something like a, a, an occupation score, some kind of a, a crude metric for the sort of status of that job. What we see is that you're more likely to have a big decline in that score if you were hit by these cutoffs. Um, and so that's sort of the, the telephone paper in, in at least half of it. There's another half of the paper that tries to understand the, the larger labor market effects on the sort of future cohorts, but I didn't need to census link them to do it, so uh, you'll have to read the paper to learn more about that. Um, and so now what, I, what, I'll, what I'll, I'll finish up with is sort of a newer paper, which again I think is uh, hopefully of the theme of census linking and, and the things we can learn from all this new data that we have access to. But what I hope you take away from this is that uh, sometimes we can use census linking in sort of new and interesting directions that are not just, you know, there's the very classic census linked paper that's like some shock happens and we follow a person over time and find out what happened to them because they were affected by that shock versus their controls. Um, not, to, not to hate on that because I read a lot of papers that look like that. Um, this is a slightly different version of that. Um, and so this is joint work with, with Sophie Liu, one of my graduate students, and, and Lauren von Velasco, who's at uh, uh, Georgia State. Um, and so this is a paper about germ theory, um, and in particular about child mortality. Um, and so I don't, uh, I say arguably, but I, I'm not sure anybody would argue too strong against this, that germ theory is like one of the most important new ideas ever. Like how do we get sick? How do we die? Like where, where does disease sort of, how does it transmit? It's a very simple idea that, you know, infectious disease moves through microorganisms. Um, and in particular, that a lot of things, especially in the, the 19th and early 20th century that killed people, were things that could have been prevented if only you could sort of stop person-to-person -person spread of things. Um, in the long run, we know that germ theory is phenomenally important in shaping modern medicine, healthcare, public health. But in the short run, we're less sure of, of how much this new idea started to matter, right? All of these sort of ways that germ theory matters are like, early 20th century, mid 20th century ideas um, or, or sort of events or institutions, whereas germ theory is sort of percolating up in the 1870s. And so do we have an early, an early treatment effect essentially? Um, so in some sense, this is a paper about ideas, right? How does science spread? Um, this is a, a paper about health disparities. Um, sort of one thing that's really interesting <laughs> today is there's a, just interesting, depressing, there's a massive gradient in, in health and mortality by income and education. That inequality was, was not so obvious historically um, and is in some way this driven by, it's one of the arguments we kind of make in the paper that this was driven in sense by, by germ theory. Um, and of course, there's the historical context. So like this is during the epidemiological transition. This is a period I work on in some other work. This is a big moment where like our, our lives change a lot. The risk of, of death changes a lot. Um, and we're still sort of fighting over what caused it. Um, okay, so what was the effect of, of germ theory on mortality? In particular, did household health behaviors, did they matter? Could you as a household do stuff that you learned about via germ theory to reduce the risk of, especially your children, dying you know, in, in childhood? Um, and so to do this, what we need is we need a really long panel, right? We want to measure people before germ theory, during and after, and sort of after uh, it's widely spread. Um, and in particular, we need to have some measure of access to knowledge about germ theory, which is obviously there's no census question, like, do you know what germ theory is? Um, and so we'll, I'll show you kind of how we, we do that. Specifically, we're going to exploit physicians. Our argument in this paper is basically the, the first line of people who should learn about germ theory and then hopefully accept it, adopt it, and maybe potentially use it at home would be physicians and their, their families. Um, and so we need some data set that's going to allow us to measure the household mortality of the kids of physicians versus other people. Um, again, it seems like a hard data ask to pull, and, and we're going to basically use census linking to sort of generate this. Um, so there's a huge 
theory in the literature that, these, that, that germ theory matters initially, that it's through these private actions, through domestic hygiene, John Mulcair has a paper about this. There's some past work that suggests germ theory really does matter. But the sort of specifics of it, the details, the contours are, are harder to know. Um, it's really obviously hard to measure diffusion of ideas. Um, it's hard to pair that with health outcomes at the right level to know if it's like not just scientists believed germ theory, but actually did something with it and could that actually save a life in, in the uh, 19th century. And then the other sort of challenge is a lot of the past work starts when the data sort of the old data started to be available, which are mostly these questions about children surviving in 1900 and 1910 in the census. Um, and so, okay, so germ theory. We used to be, uh, we used to not know what caused disease. Now we basically understand it's, it's e each other, um, right? That, that basically we move from this idea that things caused infection and, and illness and then death, and, and now we sort of, we get that it's people. Um, and so this happens around the 1870s. We show in the paper there's these sort of big changes in, in words and publications that talk about things about germ theory. Um, and we know, I guess I'll admit, as, as, as the American, there's some things that, that uh, American scientists were really good at. Germ theory was not one of them. Um, but they were, American physicians were pretty good at sort of adopting this idea. Even if, if you know, Past they're not Pasteur and Koch or, or Lister, um, but they are sort of observing that work and sort of potentially being, you know, using it at home. Um, and so our story is essentially these physicians are going to be the first treated. We also think they're ones with the biggest sort of potential gains to be had. So, you know, a, a carpenter, um, even if he knows all about germ theory, um, is unlikely to sort of change his behavior in, in really big ways that are going to protect his children. And maybe he doesn't need to because he's not encountering sick people all day. But a physician who's constantly in contact with, with people who might have infections, like that's someone who's, whose kids are potentially gr at greater risk. And so knowing to wash your hands or disinfect or, or do other things might be really valuable, especially to your own family. Um, there's really no popular campaigns about this. There's a little bit of popularization through advertising. And so if anything, we think we're getting underestimates. Some of our control guys are sort of roughly aware of what germ theory might be. Um, but, you know, that's, that's sort of okay for our story. Um, and then, you know, okay, so there's, there's obviously things we can do at home. Um, you know, it, it's not a really complicated list. And maybe some of these things were known about, were, or people were aware of, were doing them a little bit early on. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a bunch of new tasks or habits or activities that people can sort of participate in a relatively easy way that might have potentially big downstream effects. Okay, so how, how does this connect to census thinking? And I'm going to try to, to, to conclude here. Um, basically, we had some data, but it wasn't so perfect before. Maybe we, we need this long panel. We need to be able to measure mortality at, at different levels. And so what we basically do is, is sort of exploit census linking as a tool. We're going to link a father and a mother from census T to T plus 10. And we're going to say within that household, we see a bunch of kids. And if we see a kid who's five or two, um, we're going to ask, do we see them again 10 years later? Now, obviously, a 12-year-old who's going to be 22, them leaving the house is not you know, great cause for alarm. The, the likely conclusion is that they moved on to be an adult. But if we see a two-year-old who should be 12 and they're no longer in the house, that's going to signal to us there's some likelihood of, of child mortality. Um, and then we're going to attach all these awesome variables we have in the census, in particular dad's occupation, to be able to say what are the effects of, of access to germ theory. And so uh, a, a very American simple example. But we know from the census that, that um, Dowd, the Eisenhower's first child, dies in 1921. And so he's in 1920. He's not in 1930. And so that we can construct child mortality from like Wikipedia. Um, but obviously, most of the families in the census, we don't have a, a book written about them. And so we have to do this sort of imp uh, imputation of, is this kid in this first census, could that possibly be him? In this case, the name is so different, the age is so different, it, it must be a different child. And so therefore, they must have had this, this case of child mortality. Um, so we do all this linking. As I've, I've stressed to you, humans are good at this. Machines are better. Um, and so we do a bunch of training. I'll, I'll sort of uh, spare you the details of all of this. Uh, we're not the only ones doing this. There's other people sort of thinking about child mortality via linked data. Rick Steckel did this like a long time ago, and, and we're just, you know, in his debt constantly. Um, but we have this measure of mortality, and then we can do something with it. We can measure this, this, this time series. We can see that, you know, in the 19th century, child mortality is really high, right? 16% of kids that we see in the census don't show up in the census 10 years later. That thing falls over time. And then sort of the key point of this paper is basically what happens to physicians. And what happens to physicians' kids is, as germ theory arrives, the odds of their child dying in the, the next census go down. 
And now, if I showed you this graph for everybody, you might not be that convinced. But instead, what we see is the physicians look very different from the other occupations, from the lawyers, from you know, other healthcare professionals, although I guess if they're not saving their kids' lives, I'm not sure what kind of healthcare they're in. Um, these are pharmacists and dentists. Um, teachers, librarians, clerical workers, engineers. It's really only for physicians that we see this, this decline, this, this sort of effect of access to germ theory. Um, we do a bunch of robustness, which I'm going to skip because you, pr you, you trust me. Um, we do some other things to sort of prove that this diff and diff is nice and clean. Um, I'll just end with sort of a, a couple more sort of details about the, the mechanisms. We basically show a few different sort of differential effects. We see it by ethnicity. Um, we see that the German and the Polish descendants have a much sort of bigger effect of germ theory. The argument basically being is, is a lot of germ theory is happening in, in Germany and, and the Poles are sort of at the forefront of, of breastfeeding and hand washing. Um, and we see a similar effect by uh, sort of location. We might imagine that you know, if most child mortality is children dying in accidents, there's not a lot that, that the physician parents can do. But in places where child mortality is really high for sort of other reasons, maybe there's a lot of sort of low hanging fruit for the parents to protect their kids. And that's exactly what we see is that if you're in a location that's really bad for mobility, the sort of physician times germ theory effect is, is quite a bit larger. Um, okay, we do some stuff on physician quality, we write some conclusions, but let me finish because um, I, I want to sort of get to the, the Q&A. Um, so zooming back out, complete count censuses are this amazing rich data source for economic history. Part of the, the tool set of unlocking them, and it's not the only thing you can do with them. There's a lot of things you can do if you don't want to link or if you don't like linking or whatever. Um, but record linking is, an linking is an incredibly valuable tool um, to create these longitudinal samples at the individual level, at the household level, at the family dynasty level. It can be census to census. It can be census to something else. It could be something else to something else. And then I think I would argue that these ML-based methods, what they're really powerful at is creating these link samples at scale, which you know, for under-resourced graduate students uh, or uh, assistant professors with no time, that, that's a really valuable thing, um, right? We can study mobility, we can study immigration, migration, health, labor markets, political economy. There's like basically no limit to things we can study, you know, with these new longitudinal data sets. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude there and say thank you. You can see why I had problems summarizing. <laughs> uh, thank you, James. That was, that was absolutely fascinating, and, and there's so much in there. Um, we've got a bit of time now for questions. Um, as ever, uh, if you're online, uh, please uh, type in your question, tell us who you are, where you're from, and at least in theory, it will appear before me as though by magic. Um, but those of you in the room, you just stick your hands up and we'll probably start, wow, we'll start with you guys. Um, I'm going to pass up my question, save it for later. Um, let's start here and then we'll move to Neil in the middle. Hello, my name is Jenny Hunt. I'm a professor of economics visiting the LSE from Rutgers. Uh, thank you very much for the fascinating talk and your fascinating research. Thank you. I thought you might say a bit more in general about linking women. So uh, Sun Kyun Lee, I think, is doing some work roping you know, the, the women. And, um... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I think we're sort of running around in the background of, of, I think, one of the things I said, you know, we like to link on stable features, uh, you know, names. For men are stable features, there's not a lot of change. People go from nicknames to full names in adulthood, but, but last names are pretty durable. Um, for women, obviously, that's not the case. Um, we can link people before marriage pretty easily, but there's not a lot, a lot of interesting economics from like linking a two-year-old to her 12-year-old self. Um, and we can link married, married people, although obviously we're at risk of, you know, in, in times when there might be divorce or widowhood or, or some reason names change, we're going to have sort of a, a bias sample if we, if we assume the name is going to stay fixed. And so we're left with this big problem, with this big question that there's a lot of economics we, or history we'd like to do that follows women from the time they're, they're unmarried through, through marriage. And, and um, I think the answer there is, is we've just, we've got to be clever at figuring out ways to create those links. And I think, you know, hard core old school genealogy is, is certainly like one way to do that. That's sort of what I think the innovation I hope of the of the telephone operators paper is sort of figure out how to do that at scale. So, you know, I can't imagine how many untold RA hours it would have required if I had had if I'd printed out a list of, you know, the the 
10,000 telephone operators and said to an RA, go find these women in the census and then find a marriage record in some state or county or somewhere and then find them forward to, to when they're married or not married if they don't get married? Um, and how would they know? Whereas with the, the family search data, we're able to sort of leverage the, the work of all these, these descendants and these family uh, historians. Obviously, that comes with, it, with some problems, like who's actually going to be on that tree? Um, and sometimes, I, I guess, I'm, I'm drawn to work that allows us to sidestep that problem, that selection. Um, right? we, could, we could try to estimate rates of intergenerational mobility among women, but then we, then we get into these fights over, like, is the sample that we observe representative of the full population or of who we actually want to see. Um, whereas, you know, in, in this paper, what we're able to sort of defend ourselves with, and I think hopefully plausibly, is the, the control set and the treatment set are going to be sort of subject to all the same biases, that whatever sort of difference is out is going to be kind of a clean estimate of the technology shock. Um, but that's not to say that the genealogical approach is the only way to, to think about linking women. There are, you know, there are sources and periods where like the places or times where the, the marriage records are richer uh, or more systematically collected or more systematically digitized where you can sort of bounce from a census to a marriage record back to a census. There are places where birth records sort of allow you to do the same thing. Um, it's just, it's, you know, it's really a question of, of sort of figuring out the right, the, figuring out the setting you're in and the data that exists where you're there. And now if you're, if you're doing that, then that's the kind of actual example where I think the, the ML approach to census linking or an ML approach to record linkage is really usable because, you know, again, there's all the same problems with digitization and transcription. And so if you're trying to make this link and you're the only person that's ever going to make this link, you can't wait for like... Leah Busan and Rana Rubinsky to, to, to produce a, a census linking project version of like your small state or small county or small district's marriage records into the census because you're the only one who actually wants that. And so you've got to have a system that's going to allow you to create those links. And then I guess you could do it by hand, but, but sort of applying the ML in that setting seems like a, a really nice use case. Um, thanks. That was a very, very good answer. Do you really like some water? Uh, I'm not. Okay. Yeah. Um, Am I choking here? Yeah. No, 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 not at all. No, no. I, uh, Neil, Neil, I think yeah, you had your hi. hand up. Uh, th okay, thanks, James. That was a uh, like really entertaining talk. Um, <laughs> oh, no, no, because you're on, on, you're on, you're you're on, on Zoom, too. You're on Zoom, too. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe he doesn't want to be. That's the other <laughs> um, So, okay, thanks for the talk. That was really entertaining. Uh, we're coming to the end of uh, like a traumatic, heavy teaching term, and I think you did a great job of just summarizing these papers. Um, you know, deep dive into linking, but intellectually extremely stimulating. So thanks for that. Um, I'd, I'd like, there's a lot of things I'd like to pick you up on, <laughs> quite frankly, but like just in the spirit of um, just intellectually thinking about the import of these results. Um, I, so I really like this last paper, and I think this is really where this li literature needs to go, understanding individual behavior, individual chaining behavior. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about just focusing on physicians solely. Yeah. And I'm kind of thinking, because they're exposed to so much disease, are they able to switch away? You can only wash your hands so much. You're probably still bringing back some disease from yeah. to your family. But I'm kind of wondering, could you just not, I'm just thinking, could you not just look at all, uh, uh, like a grid of all occupations in the census yeah. and have a machine learning, <laughs> broadly defined script that would tell you which occupations are Seem to have that switching pattern. away? And are they consistent with the type of, occupations that would have access to knowledge about germ theory. Yeah. So we'll just move away from just picking on that. And then, okay, and the second question, which I am gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna exploit this moment here. You got the microphone. Um, I was really struck by the twins paper, which I also like a lot, but just having a, like surveyed that literature, the returns to schooling literature, um, I interpret your effects as, uh, like, I, I like it. These are really small effects relative to the, the schooling reform literature, uh, mm. and I, I, I kind of think there's some funny business going on with those results. But I, I mean, it's really interesting to see that you're finding such a, like a, a, a small effect, but yeah. um, you know, well, well identified. That was more of a comment than a question, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Cool. Very much. Um, yeah. So, so to the to the twins paper, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we try to do this more systematically in the paper, then I'll, I'll be able to tell you now. That's a pre-COVID paper, so my, my knowledge of it is, is shrinks by the day. Um, but, uh, 
you know, what we try to say is, is we know the twins literature has sort of some bias to it. The, the estimates you would get today from a twins return to schooling is not quite what you get from a pure experiment. And so we try to sort of benchmark how, how different that tells us about like the, the true return or what might be the return in this period. But I, you know, I think, yeah, we are struck by the, the overall, at least in the US during this period of the Great Compression, um, how low the returns to schooling are, at least the, the correlational returns are quite low. And so that could have been, you know, maybe that was poorly measured or maybe the correlations aren't, aren't causal, but you know, we're at least somewhat more confident in our low estimates in that literature, you know, because they look kind of like, like the correlations. Um, but I, I, I agree that like the, the, you know, it's a fundamental question for labor economists and for education economists, what's the return to education? It is a hard question to get at causally, especially historically. We're limited by data and we're limited by experiments. And I think every additional, like there are now basically two papers that try to estimate the causal return to schooling in the 1940s. Every additional paper is gonna be an important source of sort of data points. And, and obviously the US versus UK comparisons are also sort of floating out there. Um, as to the, as to your, your first question about germ theory, I, no, I think it's a, it's a great, Yes, we have, our, we have our hands on the wheel a little bit more in the sense that like we try to pick the occupations we're gonna pick and we pick the occupations we show you. There would be a much more sort of data-driven way of like here's all the occupations for which we think the sample's big enough for this estimate to be meaningful and here are basically all those beta coefficients. Here's, here's what it looks like to be the effect of germ theory on these, these guys, even in just in, in the like 1870 to 1880 period where we think the effect's gonna be biggest. And, and yeah, sort of even just like to rank those estimates and see whether physicians jumps out. My sense is from, from what we've kicked on that, that it should, um, but it, it, there could also be other occupations and, and then whether or not there's sort of a sensible reason for those occupations to sort of fit where they do in the, in the thing. The one thing I'll, I'll say is the literature's a little muddy on it is there's this, this phrase that I never know how to think about and I feel very, uh, maybe it's appropriate to say in, in Britain, like this idea of the literate classes and that's like not just people who are in fact literate but like the, you know, people who are sort of more, uh, people who read books for fun essentially I think is the right way to think about that historically. Um, <laughs> And there's this idea that they were the ones, all of them benefited from germ theory. There are articles in Harper's and the Atlantic and other places that are telling people about germ theory. And at least as far as we can tell with the occupations, obviously it's not a perfect cut, but we don't see a benefit for college professors or teachers or uh, lawyers. It, it seems something special about doctors, um, but obviously there's a hundred different occupations and we could, we could sort of, you know, maybe even more credibly say, look, doctors are the only, physicians I should say, are the only ones that sort of sit alone. Um, in this in this landscape, yeah, it's really so. interesting. Um, and obviously, college professors don't wash their hands very often. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a couple of questions from online, and then I'm going to come back to people in the room. Um, Cecilia Lenata Briones, I think it's quite an interesting question, because you're obviously spending so much time working on the census. Is there a sense in which the Census Bureau are now starting to engage with you and other people? to ask about what kind of information should be gathered? Is there a way that, that you know, is there any engagement? Is there a that's, a that's a great question. Um, I mean, of course, but the, re the person I'd love to talk to is who de designed the, the 1940 census and the I'm sure 1900 census, but they're, they're harder to get on the phone. Um, no, so, so I, I can only speak for myself, is that no one's, no one's asked me yet what, what kind of questions should be on the, the 2030 census. Um, I'm happy to, to, to give some thought to it. Um, but there has been a, a lot of sort of really nice engagement. So obviously the 72 year rule, right? We can't see the micro data with the names until 72 years pass. Um, I guess that's okay, because I, I only want so many projects at once. Um, Census has started to try to think about how they can do linkage in house of some of those restricted files. As we get closer to today, they, they have, it's, it's sort of all machine born or, or it's like easier to do, but there was a, a period for which like the 60, the 70, the 80, the 90, like there, there are these names written by hand um, and obviously they can't outsource them in the same way that the genealogy companies do. And there was a big effort within census to figure out how to machine read these names. Um, and so, and I think my sense of, of that is that they've, they've made huge progress on it. Um, almost frankly too, pa too fast because I have all this work to do with the 1940 and now soon the 50 census. And if you told me the 1980 census is gonna like show up on my doorstep um, in like a linkable way, even within census, like in a couple weeks, I'd be terrified because I'd like to keep things manageable, um, at least semi-manageable in terms of number of papers. Um, but there is, I mean, I think there's, there's like a really nice, there's a really nice group of scholars within census, outside of census, people who sort of work with census to, to think about doing this record linkage both, you know, within the historical data and then the sort of more modern semi-historical data. Mm. 
Well, one more question, and this actually kind of uh, this honestly asks you to forecast, and you may not have an answer, right? But oh, it's from okay. one of our alumni um, from class of 91, from Absaco, who's in California. And he's asking really, I mean, you're, you're observing a lot of change over the type of things you're talking about. And he's asking kind of, you know, we start to see climate migration, mm. you know. Um, do you have a sense kind of if you could, could or would think about how things might change going forward yeah. in the kind of stories? And that's a, and it's a, it's a great question. So. I guess I'll, I'll start by saying, and I don't want to offend any non-historians in the room, but I think economic history and historians more generally are going to be sort of the most valuable voices in these questions, much more than like futurists making predictions based on science fiction novels. Um, like we have, we have data on, in, in the terms of, you know, in terms of like robots and computers stealing jobs, like we have data on the telephone operators and a bunch of other industries that have been hit by massive technology shocks. And, and maybe future technology shocks will be different on some dimensions, but like they'll be similar on other dimensions. In the climate case, we have, we have examples of uh, natural disasters that, pour, that, that push people to move. Maybe not on the same scale, maybe not the same places, the same kinds, but we can use history to sort of learn some of the features of, of this setting. Um, you know, we have, we, we kind of, we also need history to sort of play out over a really long run scale, right? The effects of climate or the effects of other sort of things, big environmental shocks that push people to move, they may have very different effects on the generation that gets pushed and the generation after that and the generation after that. And so obviously we can't see into the future. We can't follow those generations today forward. But if we have a, a massive climate disaster 100 years ago or 200 years ago or even farther, we can see that play out over time. And again, in terms of making predictions, the past is, is not always the, the best way to predict these things, but it's like, I guess it's our only source of data. Um, and so there's, there's useful insights, I think, to be, to be gleaned from that. I don't have any specific predictions <laughs> to make, um, but in terms of sort of a more general idea of like where, you know, I, I, I prefer looking for predictions in data-rich environments versus data-poor data environments, I guess. Okay. Excellent, excellent answer. Um, Chris, I think I have you next, and uh, let me just check. Please, no, Chris. He's there in the middle. Is it me first? Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris Mins, Economic History Department. Thanks for a great talk. First thing I'll say, linking through marriage works great if you have digital marriage records. So if you're Canadian, have complete count census, and the Ontario marriage records, you can cover it really well. But it's going to depend on the context, right? Question is, so I was listening to the last paper, which I was really interesting, thinking about stories about how when there's a health shock, that's when people respond and try to start to understand germ theory. Thinking mm -hmm. of Werner Troskin's work, right, speculating about this. Yeah. Is that something, I guess maybe the answer is no, but to the question, can you unpick that kind of idea? If there's a locational shock, do people respond across occupations in terms of changing behavior? Yeah, no, that's, I, I, that's a, it's a fantastic point. Um, We've thought about it. I can't say that we've empirically done it yet. So there are, um, I guess, good for us as researchers, bad for the people who live through it, a bunch of sort of pen, uh, epidemics, cholera epidemics in particular in this period just before sort of germ theory arrives on the scene. So we have sort of a, we have a theory perhaps that places that are hit by worse cholera epidemics might sort of update in this way. Um, uh, it, would, it would be sort of a, a fascinating setting to, to be able to do this at not just the local level, but at the individual level, right? We know some families have relatives who die or get sick, and, and d does their behavior update? Um, so it's it's on a list of, of to-dos, um, and I think it's it, it would again it would really sort of <coughs> circle out the 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 everything that we're trying to do. You know, it would be to to sort of nail the nail the point that it is germ theory and, and sort of updating behaviors in addition to everything else. Like that would be a very con sort of consistent story. Um, and I think more generally, like the, you know, not to, not to say that every, every question needs a census linked answer, but like this idea that like individual history matters to behaviors, it's kind of something you can only get at in, in a longitudinal link sample like this. Um, and so whatever those individual shocks are, get some data set where you can observe them, find those people in the census, follow them forward, and then you can sort of, you can say something about these, about these things that might be otherwise, no one's going to collect the data set on that necessarily, but you can create the data set yourself, sort of with, you know, step by step. Um, Eric, am I right that you were, oh, oh yeah, I, 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 I have lots of questions. Yeah. It's all right, I, it's just from the conversation you have with, with Chris. And I, I, uh, no, well, yeah, if I can let it. Uh, you can. Thanks, James. This is, uh, I, this is, sorry? Uh, uh, this is really fascinating. Great, great talk. Um, <laughs> I've got to remember the question I just had in my mind. But um, 
I wonder, like along these similar lines with, with, with this paper, um, I wondered if you thought about looking at um, kind of mobility of doctors, like because there's a human capital effect here too, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, do doctors' children born before germ mm. theory do better or were, I guess, worse than, you know, do you see differential mobility? Yeah. But then the other thing I just wanted to ask you is about the magnitude, right? Yeah. So how much of the decline does this explain? Is it a big effect? Is it a small effect? Because that's really the Bakuin, yes. you know, point. Um, yes, so absolutely. So, so in terms of the, the, we haven't looked at all the sort of next generation beyond the, the first census or the, you know, we see them as a little kid, we see them or don't see them as in, in still in the household 10 years later, and then we haven't taken them to a third census to see sort of long run effects. And it's a really interesting thing that we could, we could absolutely do. And it would be, you know, it has a nice identification built in, right? It's, it's doctors, kids before and after germ theory compared to everybody else. Um, the, other, the other question about the magnitudes, yeah, I wanna be, I wanna be sort of be careful about this. Obviously, physicians are only a small share of the U.S. population, and so to the extent we see a huge, we see a pretty big decrease in ch child mortality from when our period starts to when we get into the early 20th century, of course that can't just be doctors saving their kids' lives by washing their hands or scrubbing out appropriately. Um, so among the decline that doctors see, we think that this sort of 1870 germ theory moment is is huge. Like, you know, the back of the envelope suggestions that like doctors' kids really, really benefit, and these are sort of sizable effects for them. The next thing that we haven't quite done yet, we have to figure out basically, we want to be able to scale this up, or, or does this scale up to the rest of the population? And that either requires us figuring out a little bit more carefully, like who else is treated by, by germ theory, who are the other, you know, what's the diffusion? If the doctors get 100% of the dose, who else gets what share of the dose and can we kind of scale that out to sort of make even just a back of the envelope calculation of how much of that decline is about germ theory um, or about germ theory in practice in this particular way, like germ theory before public health gets involved. Um, so we haven't done it, but it's a fantastic, it's a hard thing to do. One place to start though would just be to say, what if everybody had the same decline as the doctors? Yeah. What's the maximum effect? Yeah, no, that, that's a great, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. we should do that, yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Hopefully someone's on my team. Right, I'm just going to come around to the to to Rita because you, do you, am I right? You had a question. Yeah. Yep. And then we'll see what see where we're doing. We're coming up to. I'll talk less. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just have a question as a anthropologist who has asked. You know, I, I could re identify myself with that person with the clipboard on <laughs> next to the to the field truck. Um, obviously, you know, at the beginning you did mention possible mistakes and biases, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, aside from surnames that get yes. spelled or and so on and so forth, people just are not, not understanding the questions. And I was wondering whether you have a way of historically situating, so each census probably had, you know, both the questions, but also the historical context in yes. which these questions were Absolutely. being asked and whether you can have that in your algorithm as yes. part of the... Yeah. No, it's, I, I think it's, it's a fantastic question. I mean, there's sort of, there's a well-known history of, of the census to, you know, there, there's historians of the census, and so we can, we can hope to learn from them in terms of things that went wrong, things that went right in different years. Um, you know, there's a well-known story that, uh, you know, the 18 census, 1870 census in the U.S. Is, is, you know, very bad because in the South, a, a resistance to answering questions from the federal government uh, post-Civil War. Um, and so, you know, as an economist, what you do is, if you're going to use that data, you try to show that your results are sort of robust. You kick the tires to show, that, can that mess something up? Could it not? But I think the, the point is much deeper is that, like, I think as economic historians, as historians, as anyone using sort of quantitative data that was collected by someone else a very long time ago for its own specific sets of reasons, like, it's so important to know the context of where that data comes from, to know the sort of what's potentially missing in the data, how thinking about how that, that missingness or those problematic ways things were collected are gonna matter to what you're doing downstream. I, maybe I'm selling myself short, but like I, I don't know that there's a way to sort of algorithm our way out of some of these things. Um, if, if we know things are recorded with some sort of particular error, it's, it's just a question of like knowing that and sort of thinking through logically how could this or could this not sort of matter to my kind of downstream um, applications. And I think that's going to be so incredibly variable, sort of case to case. It really does, you know, 
Uh, you can tell when, when someone's written a, a history paper whether they've engaged with the historians or not. And I think in the same level, like you can tell whether someone's used a bunch of census data and whether they've engaged with the, the underlying history of the, of the record keeping. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, but it, it, it's obviously so important, you know, to, to the context is, is vital. I think we have time for one last question. I've seen a, a, few, a few hands very recently, but I think, Hillary, you were kind of like reaching high a few questions ago, so let me, uh, let me bring the microphone around to you in the center there, please. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I'm extremely delighted to see such a thorough kind of treatment of census linking and the methods. My question is actually a, a methods one, and I'm going back to the slide you showed, um, saying that you'd found kind of no downstream dif differences in results when kind of comparing yeah. different linking methods. And so I just, I wanted to ask you, because in the Helgert's paper, they find with this kind of the Abe sample they create, 50 to 75 percent migration, and they're, so they're showing that they pick up a lot of false positives. And when I've done this with the UK data, going down to the parish level, for some outcomes I'm seeing a range of, you know, a three to seven percentage points difference, and other outcomes up to ten percentage points. Yeah. And if I take, if I, if I reduce the uniqueness requirement and go up to the level that it's at in the American data, then I've got ranges of you know, 20 to 30 percentage points between models. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about what the models are you're comparing and why you think there, you might not be seeing those differences. That's a great question. So brief, brief I'm going to answer this extremely briefly. Um, I think the key, the key thing to all of this is, is going to be the setting. It's going to be the, the question you're asking. It's going to be um, Essentially, do you have an identification strategy that's going to be sort of independent of those errors? And so, if you're just, if you're measuring correlations over time, I think the linking methods can give you very different results. Especially, very different methods can give you very different results. It's then us, I guess we have to figure out which one we believe the most or believe the least. If we're in a setting in which we're sort of interested in some causal effect and we have some identification that we believe, then then the the setting the sort of the onus becomes: can the researcher sh prove to you or convince you as a reader or as a referee that the, um, the, the the sort of the linking is not affected by whatever your your sort of causal estimate is, your your causal treatment? Um, you know, just in the same way, we'd always sort of want to show balance when we have some identification. We you know show a dip and diff, show our pretrends we should basically imagine like linking balance is the same kind of thing. And, and so linking can be very wonky. Uh, basically, as long as it's as wonky for the treatment of the control, then hopefully we're okay. And if it isn't, then we have a deeper problem. Mm -hmm. But that's obviously gonna be case by case. We're gonna smooth over those deeper problems now. Yes. Um, and it just remains to thank you very much for an extremely interesting, fascinating lecture. Thank, thank you so much.